Good day to you all. Uh, today, I would like to remind you about how to design whole systems for radical energy and resource efficiency, thus protecting climate, not at a cost, but at a profit. The practice I'll describe applies orthodox engineering principles, but it asks different design questions in a different order to get different answers. This talk is a very selective, roughly 27 fold boil down of the 18 hours of lectures in my Stanford course, Extreme Energy Efficiency, covering all sectors and most applications with a lot of pieces and storytelling. A little background to start with. <clears throat> Around 1975, our government and industry all said that primary energy intensity could never drop. A year later, I heretically suggested it could drop 72% in 50 years. So far, it's dropped 60% in 45 years, a uh, good start. Yet just the innovations already added by 2010 can now save another threefold, twice what I originally thought, at a third the real cost. And today that looks conservative because optimizing buildings, vehicles, and factories as whole systems, not as piles of isolated parts, can often make very big energy savings cost less than small or no savings turning diminishing returns into increasing returns. I call this integrative design. RMI's 2011 business and design book, Reinventing Fire, showed a rigorous business-led market-driven roadmap uh, for tripling US energy efficiency and quintupling renewables by 2050 at historically reasonable speed. By then, a 2.6-fold bigger economy would need no oil, no coal, no nuclear energy, and at least a third less natural gas. It would cost $5 trillion less net present value, emit 82 to 86% less carbon, and have an 80% renewable, half distributed, highly resilient power grid. 11 years later, we now know how to do better than that and how to adopt and expand the light blue wedge showing a subset of the integrative design that I'll describe might wonder how that 2011 vision is doing in the marketplace. The first <clears throat> decade of this 40 year journey are pretty well on track, green actual versus blue proposed. I think largely because the private sector, folks like you smell the $5 trillion on the table. That's exactly what should be happening. But it doesn't yet include much integrative design. Uh, that practice is summarized in this peer reviewed paper uh, you can just search on its title. I'll, I'll next unpack it. It's evidence across all sectors shows that unlike, say, oil or copper, integrative design makes most new energy efficiency reserves cost less than current production. That's because they come not from adding more or fancier widgets, but from using fewer and simpler widgets, more artfully chosen, combined, timed, and sequenced. So while hydrocarbon reservoirs and metal ore bodies are finite and depletable assemblages or concentrations of atoms. Energy efficiency resources are infinitely expandable assemblages of ideas, depleting only stupidity, a very abundant resource. Before focusing on industry, let me start with a simpler example of integrative design, which you can see behind me. My wife, Judy, and I live here up near Aspen at 7,100 feet elevation, where the outdoor temperatures used to dip as low as minus 47 F with up to 39 days of continuous midwinter cloud. But our house does no combustion, that's so 20th century. Super insulation, ventilation, heat recovery, and super windows that insulate like 16 to 22 sheets of glass, but look like two and cost less than three, together make this building 99% passive solar heated, 1% active solar. Efficiency added less construction cost than eliminating the heating system subtracted. So the total CapEx fell slightly, saving also about 90% of the electricity, 99% of the water heating energy and half the water brought the total payback time to 10 months in 1983. Uh, the key to lower construction cost was to use expensive glazings because those eliminated the heating system that cost even more. The standard texts say to optimize the component R value against the saved heating fuel 
but I also considered the avoidable cost of the heating equipment, optimizing the building as a whole system, not any component alone. The central atrium seen here in a February snowstorm has so far produced 80 passive solar banana crops. Someone said I had really big earphones. Uh, without needing to look like this, our house helped inspire several hundred thousand European passive buildings that likewise have no heating and roughly normal construction cost. An analogous approach turned out to work fine in steamy Bangkok. Almost everyone on earth lives in a climate somewhere between Bangkok's and mine. Integrative design gives many benefits from each expenditure. So the white arch in the uh, top of the upper middle photo, or you can see it behind me, holding up the middle of the house has 12 different functions, but it has only one cost. Such methods keep improving. Our integrative design to retrofit the Empire State Building uh, saved 38% of its energy, later 43% with a three-year payback. Three years later, our cost-effective Denver retrofit of this federal complex saved 70%, making this difficult half-century old uh, building more efficient than what was then the best new U.S. office at NREL, which in turn is only a third as efficient as RMI's passive net positive no mechanicals office 10 minutes from here. And now there's a Bavarian building use, using two-fifths less energy still. But all these technologies existed over a decade ago. What mainly improved is not so much technology as design. So for example, the Empire State Building retrofit set up a Teamsters run window factory on a vacant floor to remanufacture all 6,514 windows into super windows, make them on site so they'd pass light through but block heat and that plus better lights and office equipment and air handlers and stuff cut the maximum cooling load by a third. But then renovating smaller chillers instead of adding bigger chillers saved 17 odd million dollars of capex paying for most of the other improvements and cutting the payback to three years or less than one year if we had counted non-energy benefits to the owner of the tenants. A major ESCO didn't get the job because they offered a three-year payback with disintegrated design yielding only a sixth the savings that we got. Integrative design requires doing the right steps in the right order. For example, to keep people comfortable in hot places, first cool the people, not the building, which has no comfort sensation, as in these hyper chairs that can keep us comfortable in air temperatures up to about 86 F with 3.6 watts of silent fans. Then expand the range of conditions in which people feel comfortable. For example, good ceiling fans expand the summer comfort range by about nine to 13 F. Then minimize the unwanted heat and humidity gains within or into the space. <clears throat> Next, apply passive cooling, then active but non-refrigerative cooling. Next would come super efficient refrigerative cooling like Lee and Glock's cheaper Singapore HVAC with tripled design hour efficiency. That COP 6.8 or 0.52 kilowatt per ton end to end for the whole system, supply fans through cooling towers. And now he thinks he can achieve COP 9.3. <coughs> Next, if needed, would come cool storage and controls. But actually, we need never get as far down the list as refrigerative cooling, or probably even step four, to save 90 to 100% of the cooling energy with better comfort and uptime and lower whole system capex, even in the most severe climates. Most practitioners pursue these options in reverse order, worst buys first. And the latest findings reveal a path to keeping people cool outdoors in Singapore with no electricity, delivering purely radiative cooling by passively rejecting heat from spectrally selective surfaces to the sky. So watch that space. Now, integrative design yields similar breakthroughs in light and heavy vehicle design. For example, an ultralight carbon fiber electrified hypercar like this four to six fold more efficient midsize SUV we designed 22 years ago with a couple of tier ones. And in 2007, Toyota designed this 70% lighter so-called 1X carbon fiber plug-in hybrid. In 2013, this profitable quadruple efficiency carbon fiber electric car came to market, more on that in a minute. Even aluminum fleet bands like this plug-in hybrid we developed and road tested in 2009 can save a fifth of US light duty vehicle fuel 
profitably with no subsidy. And carbon fiber autos could save more oil than Saudi Arabia lifts, yet with radically simplified manufacturing, they could be made at normal cost. And we know that because BMW did it nine years ago with this carbon fiber electric car that I drive. And it's called an I3, and it reportedly made money from the first unit off the assembly line. Sandy Monroe, the normally understated dean of automotive costing, called it the most significant vehicle since the Model T and the most advanced vehicle on the planet. Validating our 1990s claims, its carbon fiber is paid for by the batteries that its lightness saves. And then fewer batteries mean faster recharging with less infrastructure. Its integrative design decompounds mass far more than usually assumed. Its manufacturing is radically frugal, confirms the elimination of the conventional body and paint shops, and is much better for workers. Overload Synergies quadruple its efficiency without compromise and with many driver advantages. The i3s was Europe's best-selling EV in 2018, still in the top 10 two years later when BMW extended its model life for a final two years, and it sold somewhere around a quarter million units. Now, in the next efficiency, LeapFrog, two solar-powered hypercars are expected to enter the market this, uh, this year, both from little firms I advise. Most drivers will never need to recharge this two-seat electric vehicle because its solar cells, three square meters, capture enough energy to drive about 25 to 40 miles a day, as if your present car magically added two gallons of fuel to its tank every day you park it outside. For a long trip, household power can quickly recharge the tiny little batteries you can see in the lower left uh, for ranges up to 1,000 miles. Now, my BMW and Tesla electric cars outside are among the most efficient now sold, but this two-seat vehicle with a very crash-worthy composite body will nearly triple their efficiency to the equivalent of 343 miles a gallon. And then the Dutch firm Lightyear also plans a five-seat, four-wheel, 450-mile range light aerodynamic car whose five square meters of solar cells and 251 miles per gallon equivalent efficiency can add about eight miles of range for every hour in the sun. So the charging infrastructure that others have to pay for, these super efficient vehicles aim to bypass. And even they can be improved further by lighter materials and some recent advances in propulsion. Well, now let's apply these non-industrial examples approach to industry, to your work. Reinventing Fire showed how to get US mobility off oil for 18 bucks a barrel at a 17% internal rate of return. And also how the building stock, which uses three fourths of US electricity can become three or four times more efficient, saving $1.4 trillion net with a 33% IRR. Now I'll sketch how US industrial efficiency can at least double with at least a 21% IRR. And then going beyond that analysis, how to save en energy indirectly by saving some of the most energy intensive materials. Now, reinventing fires industrial analysis was systematic and very straightforward. It started with EIA's 2010 forecast. It backed out the projected compositional and efficiency changes and the added cogen, CHP. And then we subtracted the energy no longer needed to refine the uh, hydrocarbon fuels that transportation will no longer need but we added production of biofuels and hydrogen. We counted some additional technologies that Berkeley Labs said were entering the market back then. And then we completed the cost-effective cogen and waste heat recovery slate to get five quads less industrial energy use in 2050 than in 2010, despite 84% higher industrial output. So these efficiencies together save $0.9 trillion present value at a cost of $0.2 trillion. We also added some integrative design savings, a little 1.1 quads in the next to right bar. Uh, <clears throat> but very conservatively, we counted them only for drive systems and fluid handling, not for other process equipment or process design. That's a big conservatism. RMI's industrial practice rarely achieves overall industrial savings as small as the 50% that this analysis found. Instead, across diverse sectors, our latest 50 or $60 billion worth of industrial retrofit designs typically found about 30 to 60% energy savings paying back in a few years. And in new builds, 
40 to 90 plus percent savings with generally lower capex. That's far better than the brown retrofit zone the most ESCOs deliver shown in the upper left corner is that orange oval. And our better results come from rethinking industrial processes and redesigning basic elements like pump, fan, and motor systems. So let's get into those a little. Uh, let me give you just one example first from that chart, just one of those data points. It's our collaborative redesign of a Texas Instruments wafer fab to use 40% less energy with 30% or $230 million lower construction costs. So it got built in Texas, not China. Its system efficiencies eliminated one of the two utility floors and it inspired cutting company-wide chip making energy intensity by 62%, water 56%, greenhouse gas, uh, 57%, all by 2017 and more later. Armai's next wafer fab design, by the way, showed how to save about two thirds of the energy use and half the total capex while replacing all 22,000 tons of chillers with any of three natural cooling methods that can yield upwards of 100 units of cooling per unit of electricity. Now about 70% of industrial energy provides process heat, 90% of it fossil fueled. So nearly two thirds of industry's final energy, that's one third of the global total, is fossil fueled process heat, creating 45% of industry's carbon emissions. Half the process heated is needed at under 750 Fahrenheit, 400 C, a third of it is needed at under the boiling point, 212F. Heat pumps can perform, uh, well, sorry, wrong button. Heat pumps can perform well at up to at least 355F, 180C, soon higher. But better still is not to need the heat. Let me tell you a little story. When Tesla's then CTO, the engineering genius uh, J.B. Straubel, began designing the all-electric, all-PV power gigafactory, his first decision was to install no gas pipe and do no combustion. This saved a precious six to 12 months on the Nevada air permit. Gee, I wonder what that's worth in the battery business. But his colleagues thought he was nuts because just the biggest process heat load for solvent redistillation would normally need a thermal megawatt of gas boilers. But JB replaced that megawatt with one 15 electric kilowatt heat pump that would fit under your dining room table because the process needed only a 2.7 F delta T, a one Kelvin lift. So that physics smart choice saved 98.5% of the energy and all the emissions. Similarly, similarly, a European factory's retrofit saved 92% of their total process heat energy. So before just replacing a furnace or boiler with a heat pump, carefully consider how much heat and how hot you really need. Now, you're all experts better than I'll ever be at saving heat and molecules. So I want to focus today less on those opportunities and more on electric auxiliaries which tend to be a bigger gold mine because they get less intense and less skilled attention. For example, better pipe and duct design can save about 80 or 90% of the friction, 97% in my house. And if everybody did this, it could save roughly a fifth of the world's electricity or half the coal fired electricity, typically paying back in less than a year in industrial retrofits and instantly in new builds. Just as my house paid up front for super insulation by eliminating the heating system, so the fatter pipes and ducts more than repay any higher first cost by shrinking the pumps, fans, motors, and power supplies. Now such radical savings require two changes in the design process, the design mentality. First, we spec big pipes and small pumps, not small pipes and big pumps. Friction in a pump, of course, falls as nearly the fifth power of its diameter. So how fat should the pipe be to optimize the friction? Well, <clears throat> the standard textbooks all say to make the pipe just as fat as will repay its extra cost over the years from the saved pumping energy. But that's wrong because it leaves out the capital cost of the pumping equipment. A pumping system, a pump, motor, inverters, electricals all have to be big enough to overcome the friction. So their size and roughly their capex Will, call, will fall as nearly the fifth power of pipe diameter. But the capital cost of the fatter pipe rises as only about the second power of diameter. 
So when we optimize the pipe as a component, we pessimize the system. Instead, optimizing the entire system at once yields fat pipes and tiny pumping equipment, so the total capex goes down. Okay, so far? <clears throat> now, the second shift in design is even simpler and thus harder. We lay out the pipes first, then the equipment. You know, traditionally you put the tanks, boilers, whatever, in some convenient traditional arbitrary place, and then you call in the pipe fitter to connect point A to point B. But by then A and B are far apart, other stuff got in between, they're at the wrong height, they face the wrong way. And by the time the pipe snakes across the space, all dressed in neat right angles like they teach us in trade school, it has about three to six times the friction it would have had with a straight shot. The pipe fitters like this because you pay them by the hour, they mark up the extra pipes and fittings, and they're not paying for your bigger pumping system or your bigger electric bill forever after. But for you as owners, it's smarter to make pipes fat, short, and straight than skinny, long, and crooked. So low friction pipes make the blue pump on the right so tiny it looks like somebody slipped a decibel point, but they didn't. And you notice it's raised up on a plinth to meet the pipe rather than conventionally dipping the pipe down to a pump on the floor. Or in this layout, the tan shillers would normally be in a neat row, but here they're staggered to eliminate the pipe elbows. And yet such rearrangement of designers' metal furniture remains largely unnoticed and unpracticed. It's not yet in any standard engineering textbook, industry forecast, government study, or climate model. Why not? Because it's not a technology, it's a design method. And few people yet think of design as a scaling vector, a way to make things big fast. You know, one of the greatest chemical companies is superb at cogen at saving heat and molecules and at enculturating efficiency. So they, they already saved over $20 billion worth on a $1 billion investment, but they still don't use these tricks to minimize fluid handling friction. It was too simple for them to think of. And if a tenfold pumping saving sounds incredible, just consider that at this moment, your heart is pumping blood about 10 times as efficiently as typical industrial pumping systems pump water. If you're roughly 60,000 miles of fractal blood vessels down to the tiniest of capillaries, have the design and friction of standard industrial piping, you would need a heart bigger than your body. Very inconvenient. But in fact, your 12 ounce, one and a half watt heart suffices because your blood follows nature standards design, which is called laminar vortex flow. That's a whole other conversation about the other main design revolution, biomimicry, innovation inspired by nature, which can, among other things, make pumps and fans tens of percent more efficient in, in products like these that are now starting to enter the market. Uh, <clears throat> but even without biomimicry, in the Oakland Museum, my colleague Peter Rumsey retrofitted an efficient condenser water pumping layout or piping layout that cut the pumping energy by three fourths with a two or three month payback. And it eliminated 15 pumps that will never again waste energy and maintenance costs. Mega pumps are the best kind. Repiping re the chilled water pumping loop and added, adding variable frequency drive then doubled the flow and saved 85% of the energy. Peter simply asked the pipe fitters to lay out the supply pipes as if they were drains. Here's how most big buildings pipe cooling tower water back to the condenser. But if we lay it out instead the way Peter does, everything gets better. The only obstacle is force of habit. We should bend minds, not pipes. So what do such savings mean for the pumps and fans that use half the torque of the motors that use over half the world's electricity? Well, from the fuel burned in the power plant to the end use, the flow, many successive losses compound. So only a 10th of the energy in the fuel comes out the pipe as flow. But now, turn those compounding losses around backwards from right to left into compounding savings. And every unit of flow or friction you save in the pipe saves 10 units of fuel cost emissions and what Hunter Lovins calls global weirding back at the power plant. So also as you go back upstream, the components get smaller and cheaper. So the total capex goes down. Therefore, always start your savings downstream. Start at the end. Start with intent, with purpose. Then your design logic flows back upstream in the opposite direction to the energy flow. In fact, it follows the money flow. Now let's apply this logic to say big old data centers. 
two thirds of the fuel fed into the power plant gets lost in the plant and grid. Half the metered electricity is then lost in the cooling system and under uninterruptible power supplies, which are together about half the facility's capex. And that's before reaching the servers. But then half the server energy doesn't get to the chips because it's lost in inefficient, usually very underloaded power supplies and in lots of fans to take heat that largely shouldn't be there off the motherboard into the room so we could do dumb things with it. And the next problem is severe underutilization of computing resources, partly through insufficient virtualization. The resulting energy flow is about to disappear way at the lower right of the diagram. So let's enlarge it, magnify it before it vanishes. So next comes bloatware running many unnecessary threads and processes is making simple tasks very complex because compute cycles were considered cheaper than programmers attention and someone else was buying the energy. Downstream of all that, you may even have inefficient business processes. In all, a few hundred thousandths of the original fuel energy ends up actually delivering customer value. So where should we start fixing this? Downstream, first write elegantly terse code optimally compiled with the goal that every compute cycle is a needed and wanted one. I had assumed this could save an order of magnitude in compute cycles, but recent tests suggest it's probably two orders of magnitude. That's how bad the bloatware is. And now the shift to mobile devices makes this valuable to fix because efficient code stretches battery life. Well, next we can at least quadruple server efficiency now even more and the servers will need about an order of magnitude less cooling and power supply, both of which can be done in smarter ways. We could even save half the utility losses by using fuel cell trigen cheaper than the UPS it displaces. So multiply those savings from downstream to upstream and you get at least two orders of magnitude energy savings, conceivably three. In the actual project for which we made this diagram, uh, let's see, 13 years ago, the client rejected most of our recommendations, so we were only able to triple efficiency at the same capex. But our partner EDS said that had they all been adopted, we would have ended up saving about 95% of the energy and half the total capex. Now in 1989, I wrote the dry power volume of a FAT6 volume encyclopedia that's still probably the most detailed effort to apply integrative design to most end uses of electricity. And the potential savings may since have gotten bigger and cheaper by at least as much as they've been used up, but we don't really know that and we ought to find out, uh, DOE. Now, our analysis examined all significant motor types at the time, induction in red, synchronous in yellow, DC in green. And our system boundary was from the electric meter to the input shaft of the driven machine. So we counted the efficiency upstream in the wires and controls in the motor itself, in the mechanical torque transmission downstream, but not in say the pump or the pipes. We analyzed 12 main categories of successive savings for induction motors, plus those more simply analyzed for synchronous and DC motors. And together we found these improvements uh, shown in blue could cumulatively save nearly half the total 1986 US drive system energy with paybacks typically under a year at a nickel tariff. Uh, this 1989 RMI finding is twice IEA's current estimate of profitable potential at a much lower cost. And let me sketch why that is. Among induction motors, more efficient motors generally use more and better copper and iron, so they should cost more to make. But for whatever reason, they're not priced that way. When we last called up the Motor Master Plus team uh, 11 years ago, standards had already knocked the worst motors off the market. So the modders, modelers assumed we're all done. They didn't want to bother requerying their model, but they humored us and did so anyway. And they were astonished to find there was still no correlation between efficiency and price for common motor types up to at least 300 horsepower. As shown in the earlier right-hand graph here for 100 horse, around 1998, you could still buy the most efficient uh, 100 horse induction motor standard type cheaper than nearly the least efficient, otherwise comparable specs. And therefore you could save a present value upwards of 20,000 bucks per motor. But the numbers were not very different in 2011 when a 250 horse motor, 460 volt, 60 hertz, 1800 RPM, NEMA type BTFC 
the cheapest model was also the most efficient if you shopped carefully. By the way, efficiency has also been found uncorrelated with price for common industrial pumps, most rooftop chillers, refrigerators, TV, bunch of other stuff. So don't assume that efficient equipment costs more. Shop around. In God we trust, all others bring data. Now, more recently, better design has made the most efficient motors a lot cheaper. In 2014, for example, Hitachi designed a short axial flux 11 kilowatt motor whose amorphous iron core cut the iron losses 90%. The cheap ferrite magnets <coughs> could then get the same torque from one third the field strength. The 30% lower losses eliminated the cooling fans, saving more energy and downtime. And the ferrite magnets are a lot cheaper than the rare earth magnets used in commercial Abebe or Brazilian or Danish motors. By 2017, a rare earth magnet motor equivalent to a conceptual IE7 standard, two notches above the top actual standard, four or five notches above what many US factories still use, had been demonstrated. And like Hitachi's, that motor has such small losses that it needs no cooling. Last year, IE6 entered the market. Next comes IE7 and beyond. Soon that sort of performance may get much cheaper with the emerging iron nitride super magnets. They're cheaper than rare earth magnets. They're potentially more powerful, about twice the energy product, but they contain no rare earths. Or more surely, just go for today's magnetless reluctance machines, which have many other advantages, including cost if properly designed. But there's a lot more to motor efficiency than the nameplate ratings. The standard to measure retrofit, upgrading IEC twos and usually adding ASDs captures only about half the savings available from a whole system approach to the drive system alone without improving the pumps and pipes, the fans and ducts or other downstream equipment. That should of course happen first. So our whole system approach uh, doubles the savings and cuts the cost per save kilowatt hour by roughly fivefold by sequencing not just two, but 35 kinds of improvements of which 28 are free byproducts of the first seven. And thus tunneling through the cost barrier and triggering side benefits that as DOE found uh, are generally worth more than the energy savings. Moreover, this bigger, cheaper saving needn't wait for routine motor burnout that can often be profitable to do immediately increasing the present value. I hope DOE will revisit and update and apply our 1989 synthesis of all 35 dry system improvements. And I wish we had enough time today to explore it more fully. But instead, I want to take another track here and follow General Eisenhower's wise advice to make tough problems soluble by expanding their boundaries to encompass more options and more synergies so they include what the solution requires. So for example, in making energy intensive materials like the steel and cement that now release 15% of the world's CO2, before we rush to need less cooler, cleaner and renewable process heat, what should we do first? We should start with demand for those energy intensive materials need less, use other, use less, use longer, use again, align incentives. Only after minimizing need should we redesign the process. And this bigger system boundary can capture some immense opportunities that I synthesized in two papers last year. Uh, <clears throat> just smarter structural design can profitably save at least half of the world's cement and steel. For example, substituting tension for compression structures typically gives better strength aesthetics and cost with one eighth the tons. Fabric forms permit optimal shapes that can save over half the concrete in beam sheets and other common shapes to deliver the same or better strength and stiffness. And then the weight savings compound because you need less strength to hold up less weight. This folded concrete roof pre-stressed with carbon fiber is just four centimeters thick, but it replaces a 30 centimeter thick steel and concrete slab. It costs less and it saves three fourths of the materials and there's nothing to rust. 
This rendering of an airy bridge shows how 3D printing can eliminate most of the weight of concrete structures that mostly support themselves, not their payload. <clears throat> this beautiful stainless steel bridge was 3D printed. And then next, substitute natural composites like wood or bamboo, add carbon fiber to save more structure, perhaps adopt carboxylate chemistries to make cement a net absorber of CO2. So here's a summary of that fourfold more materials efficient roof slab redesigned as a loaded floor slab from one of the best structural engineering firms in the world. The trapezoidally folded slab at the bottom is over twice as materials efficient as the middle standard configuration. And yet it's the cheapest solution and it contains no steel to rust. So why should we care about floor slabs? Because they're about half the total weight of a mid, typical mid or high rise building. These thick slabs also need more concrete in beams, columns, and foundations to support their weight. Now, the flat slabs are easily poured into simple prismatic forework, but they make no sense structurally. Look at the tiny drawings in the far upper left here. Loading weight onto a flat slab makes it sag, so the top compresses and the bottom stretches, but concrete strength is far greater in compression than in tension. So most of the thickness provides little value, little strength, and over half the concrete gets cracked. Look how much thinner a curved vault or shell under those drawings can be, resisting load by compression with less stress, minimal cracking, greatly improved materials efficiency. Now some British designers are using 3D printed shallow domes built up to a flat top with stiffening ribs and fabric formed thin vaulted shells topped with concrete foam. So that eliminates about 62% of the weight, 64% of the embodied energy. I look forward to GSA and DOD and your firm's leadership in adopting these technologies. You can also save another 15% of core structural materials, 9% of the glazing, three quarters of the energy and much time and cost in a mid or high rise building while increasing net rentable space by a stunning 55%. This three for two concept designs out a vertical meter odd of mechanical plenum you can see at the far left at each story. So then three stories with optimal nine foot two ceiling height fit into the vertical space previously needed for two stories. The mechanical systems get designed out or integrated into other building elements. Cost, complexity, and time fall dramatically. Everything gets better. So why would you build any other way? So diverse and under-examined demand side options for using less cement, steel, aluminum, paper, plastics, and so on multiply to very large savings before circular economy, more benign products and efficient processes, uh, <clears throat> fuel switching and renewables. And such efficient end use has big multipliers back upstream to materials extraction and production, leaving far less high temperature process heat to decarbonize. Adding those missing first eight lines in white to the conventional gray 12 line opportunity space, greatly expanding the system boundary, in other words, makes the process heat problem much easier. But this requires cultural change. And by the way, if you go to MIT Sloan Management Review, and uh, I'll, I'll ask the organizers here to get that reference to you. If you do it by tomorrow, you can get for free my companion business paper that came out there last August. Uh, with five new business strategies or models for capturing the kind of technical potential I just described. Now, what may seem like magic in many of these design stories requires, as, as Francis Bacon said, some new methods. And let me give you a couple of them. First, organize your designers differently. Our basic design of that four to six fold more efficient hypercar SUV didn't use a thousand plus engineers as normal, it used seven all around the same table and collectively responsible for dauntingly ambitious whole vehicle requirements. Each engineer was also responsible for one major vehicle system or function. Uh, but for those, we deliberately wrote no requirements because we didn't want him to make his problem into her problem. We wanted to make the whole team design a highly integrated vehicle together. Two of, two of the engineers were not comfortable without their very own requirements. So we replaced them in the first week or two then it went great. Toyota asked how we did it. We told them and out came their 70% lighter 1X. Second, such no novel design processes flow from revolutionary design mentality. 
Dick Taggart learned at the Skunk Works to design in the future, not in the past. So when the Soviets shot down Francis Gary Powers' U-2 spy plane in 1960, Kelly Johnson did not say, I'm going to design a slightly better U-2. He said in paraphrase, I want to own the skies for decades, so we'll design a Blackbird. I don't know how, but we'll figure out. And they did. It took about 13 months. You see, Johnson understood that such an airplane was impossible within the conventional design context. He knew that design is a bit like a rubber band. If you try to stretch it too far from the conventional design space, you encounter more and more resistance and eventually it breaks. But if instead you jump to the new design space you aspire to, then you can stretch the rubber band back to fit technologies that aren't ripe yet. And then as they mature, the rubber band relaxes to where you want to be. And if you really cultivate beginner's mind, the foundation of integrative design, you can reframe and avoid the whole problem. Let me give you a sweet example. A new environmental manager at Safeway was asked to figure out what to do with the fatty waste left over from using hot water under high pressure full of nasty chemicals to clean out the pipes in their ice cream factory after making one flavor so they can set up for the next batch in a different flavor. That cleaning and disposal were very expensive. One day, the manager asked, why are we throwing out all this tasty and costly stuff? Why don't we just run the differently flavored batches continuously back to back, keep track of the mix zone where flavors mix and then package and sell that as say, magical mystery tour ice cream, exotic mixed flavors, no two alike, you'll love the exciting variety. Well, it turned out to be a huge hit. The profit margin was enhanced by saved raw materials like cream and flavorings, avoided costs for the waste disposal and the time and materials for cleanouts not really needed for hygiene, the extra production achieved for free by converting cleaning capacity and time to more production, and most fun, the extra profit margin when they discovered that instead of having to discount this non-standard product, they could actually charge a novelty premium. <clears throat> Of course, the new product cannibalized sales of old products, but one hopes those products uh, were sold by competitors who didn't think of this first. Hmm, yum. So this delicious example illustrates the logo in the lower right corner, which says Muda Nashi, no Muda. It systematically turns every kind of waste into value and profit. So to wrap up, Integrative design systematically applies 13 pillars elaborated through numerous cases in my Stanford course. I won't go through them here, but I think they're pretty obvious. Uh, and they result in eight simple priorities, each with important benefits. Integrative design has immense potential. It probably adds up to at least five fold for long run global energy productivity. And yet it's not normally recognized, taught, delivered, expected, or rewarded. Observing buildings, vehicles, and factories in over 70 countries for 50 years or so, I see the same design errors repeated everywhere because they're widespread in our textbooks and our classrooms. So I'm hatching a plot for, well, to put it a might impolitely, the nonviolent overthrow of bad engineering. Teaching disintegrated design condemns our descendants to perpetual retrofit of inefficient stuff. Not a worthy legacy. So to help us be good ancestors, I'm seeking fellow students, teachers, and especially practitioners to collaborate on making integrative design shift rapidly from rare to normal. So it gets as common as grass. I would like to help retread in practice design professionals and the tradespeople like pipe fitters and sheet metal workers and mechanical contractors who informally designed many systems. I'd like to help improve design software to allow and coach integrative design and to find iconic CEOs, who knows, maybe yours, to apply this work in their firms and to spread the good news of Five Eta to their peers, much as Jack Welch did with Six Sigma. I want to test the 20 odd known scaling vectors, seek more, see what works and start scaling. So if you'd like to play, let's talk. Meanwhile, go forth and be fruitful and subtract. Thank you all for your good work and your kind attention.